and welcome to the Brown Bag Lunch Series, Center for African American Studies. Um, thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure, a real pleasure, to introduce the speaker for today, who is Jessica Millwood, um, who is a member of the History Department, um, has been at UCLA for some time now. Jessica, <laughs> too long, <laughs> just <Okay>. some time. <laughs> where she was an undergraduate student, and um, she came to the um, MA program in African American Studies here, um, where she did her thesis on, I believe, slavery and sex, and one of the slavery and sex in a very fine thesis, and then into our PhD program in American History. It's been my pleasure to work with her since then. Um, Jessica is extremely bright. She's one of our best students in the history department. And um, she has been rewarded for that, numerous awards and honors. Um, she has, for example, been um, a fellow of the Institute of American Cultures for African American Studies. Um, she has been a fellow at the David Library of the American Revolution, a uh, fellow the doors of the Colonial Wars, which she was our first or our second awardee uh, um, endowed uh, fellowship that we have in the history department. And she has just been awarded the um, OAH Huggins Coles Award, uh, the OAH being the largest organization of American historians in this country, so it's a distinct honor. Um, Jessica has just been chosen as a postdoctoral fellow at um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for the next academic year as well. So she is on the fast track, she's <laughs> been here for a while, and um, <laughs> she's doing very, very well. Um, she is... Um, working on a dissertation, which is an extremely important dissertation, looking at um, slavery in an interesting period of our country's history during the era of the American Revolution. Um, and as such, she has really distinguished herself because most people who work on that the problem of slavery, um, either in the colonial era or more properly in the antebellum era. So Jessica is really straddling um, sort of those two um, areas by looking at this transitional period, um, not only for slaves, but also for the country as well. And um, I think coming up with some very interesting findings. She is near completing the first draft of her dissertation and will be um, finishing up her dissertation this summer. And um, I'm sure we'll all look forward to hearing what you have to say today, Jessica. I didn't mean to stack the audience this way. So it is good to see so many friends, mentors, committee members. So I, I really didn't mean to stack the this way. Um, thank you all for coming. Sure. Well, thank you all for coming. I realize it's kind of late, so that means if you haven't finished classes, then, well, you have to start grading. And if you aren't teaching, then you have to start writing. So thank you for coming. Um, Alex and I were very nervous about having the 10th week of um, so, with that in mind, let me start by saying really just several disclaimers for this project. One is an acknowledgement, which is that this project has been graciously and generously funded through the Center for African American Studies, both in the fellowship and in research grants. So, thank you to committee members who may or may not be here and to the leadership of CAS. Um, I, I really want to begin today by talking about really giving an intellectual genealogy of the piece, and Professor Stevenson set it up very well, because the piece I'm presenting today is derived from my dissertation, and my dissertation is entitled, A Choice Parcel of Country Born, Slaves and the Transition to Freedom in Revolutionary Maryland, and it starts at 1770 and goes through 1830. And I use the term country born because at this period in American history, you have slaves that are born in the U.S. that are referred to as country born, obviously and slaves who are saltwater Negroes or Africans from various locales. So in that way, I use that term really to position the work. It's not so much that I'm referring to slaves that are actually born in the US as that I'm talking about slaves who are born in this moment. This moment when the United States is not yet realized, it's, it's only conceived and visualized, but it hasn't been realized by the culmination of the American Revolution. And it's also a time when you have high importations of Africans coming from places like the Bight of Benin, the Bight of Biafra, going directly th to the Chesapeake, to the, through the port of Annapolis. And they're coming in contact with British colonists, um, second and third generation Americans, and really African Americans who might look like them but really have no remembrance of Africa. So this is really 
is really a, a being born piece. So, um, in terms of the arguments that I'm addressing, it really it does it straddles two time periods. So it straddles what um, early Americanists call the classic American paradigm, which is American slavery, American freedom. This transition to racial slavery in what becomes the United States. Anyone doing history or taking a history course at the undergraduate level, after 1975, probably came in contact with Edmund Morgan's book, American Slavery and American Freedom. And this isn't the quintessential study of how racial slavery developed in the United States, but it is this paradigm that all of the generalizations are tested. So when I read this book, and many people had to for the qualifying exams, I was struck because there is an agenda analysis, and for all the discussion of slavery, there, of course, is little discussion about the lives of slaves themselves. So in that vein, I said, oh, well, let's really see what Africans and African Americans were doing in early America. And then when I chose my state, at that point it was a colony, it was Maryland, I came up with another interesting paradox, which is Maryland, after the American Revolution, though it was a primarily slaveholding society, has this rapid rise of free blacks after the American Revolution. So I really have a testing graph in slavery freedom debate. The study was going to be the quintessential study of slave women in Maryland. But all these um, black men and white women and landed white men and elite white women, they just they continue to show up in the story. So I just incorporated them into the story. That is how we're going to have this chapter today talking about colonists and slaves and the impact of the American Revolution. And I, you know, as historians, we do read our paper, so I don't have any flat, flashy PowerPoint presentations. But <laughs> Marty is my very, very talented assistant who's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and I should also issue this rejoining. You're probably wondering why I'm standing in this lovely and elegant podium. The cast podium is too tall. So <laughs> thank you to Alex and Barry for getting something that works for me. <laughs> Way too tall for me. Okay, so freedom's paradox. Colonist slaves and the American Revolution in Maryland. In 1770, young John Galloway wrote to his father Samuel from a trading voyage to the British Leeward Islands. Galloway was particularly enthusiastic about his interaction with sailors from a man of war stationed in Antigua. The sailors talked about the impending confrontation with Great Britain, he writes. Quote, but with no more certainty than when I left Maryland, unquote. In addition to surveying responses to the tensions between the colonies and the mother country, Galloway also tended to the challenges of shipping goods to America. On the small island of St. Eustatius, and you see it's very, very, very small in this corner, kind of by St. Kitts and St. Croix, he um, encountered a problem. He expressed frustration with the rising coffee prices and his own reluctance to transport contraband items. What happens in, in, on the island of St. Eustatius, it becomes a major shipping post during the American Revolution for Americans, since there were so many embargoes. So this island becomes very important. Galloway was quite anxious about whether to venture the dry goods or only to bring, as he writes, uh, molasses and sugar Negroes. In this one letter, Galloway highlights the central paradox of his generation. The American colonists' simultaneous pursuit of liberty from Britain and their increased commitment to chattel slavery. For Maryland slaveholding families, such as the Galloway's, dissatisfaction with the Crown's mercantilist policies coexisted with the family business of shipping, slave trading, and slave owning. John Galloway was more concerned with smuggling illegal goods to America than he was of picking up a few, quote, sugar Negroes, unquote. The shipping and trading of these Caribbean blacks, or any slaves for that matter, was a productive and even safe venture for the Galloways in the 1770s. In several documents, the Galloways were criticized by their associates for building ships for the British, but not for their lucrative, lucrative trade in slaves. And in truth, the Galloways transported far fewer slaves to America than any of their contemporaries. For instance, from 1740 to 1750, Two ships owned by Samuel Galloway entered the port of Annapolis with only one man and one woman respectively. Other Maryland traders owned slave ships that imported upwards of 300 people on a single boat voyage. But don't worry, what the Galloways lacked in terms of overall shipment of slaves in comparison to other traders, they more than made up for the role of slaveholder. The various branches of the Galloway family held slaves in western and eastern Maryland and as far away as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. When John Galloway wrote his father in 1770, 
Maryland's economy was firmly committed to slavery, but individuals such as himself were perhaps less certain about going to war with Britain. No matter how tentative the war, the impending war may have been, by the time of the revolution, the, the colony of Maryland was quite a mature slave society. And with this, it was complete with all the tensions surrounding human bondage. Pursuit of profit and power by slaveholders was unequally balanced with the slave struggle to main, maintain a sense of family and community amidst threats of sale, sexual exploitation, and other forms of brutality. For whites and blacks in Maryland, life in this slave society played out against the backdrop of, American, of the American Revolution. However, white and black Marylanders, or since I've lived there for a while, Marylanders, <laughs> found ways to ensure their liberty in distinctly different ways. Am I right? <laughs> for whites, the American Revolution represented the culmination of repeated attempts to reconcile peacefully with the mother country on one hand, and to some extent, ensure the promise for a more egalitarian society based on access to opportunity for landless white males um, and not predetermined hierarchies. When requests for more lenient trade laws and decreased military presence in, and, the, and an increased military presence um, in cities like Boston, created to really the culmination of the American Revolution in the Boston area, it was then that the Maryland um, colonial leaders decided to turn to war. And I say this because they reluctantly turned to war. There are several documents, um, legal documents, authored by a group of landed white elites. Um, the Association of Maryland Freemen, who, if you follow their papers, they went from being very loyal to the mother country to thinking, maybe we can side to the colonies to, okay, perhaps we're going to do this. So they were always very tentative until right until about 1773, when one of the slave I talked about, Charles Carroll Carrollton, goes to Philadelphia and is convinced that, okay, this is this is a this is a valiant cause, and plus a lot of these people were. Um, traders and um, heavily invested in really the continual economic development in Maryland. So it's not too surprising that they turned to the work. For enslaved Africans and enslaved African Americans and Caribbean blacks, um, the American Revolution produced significant confusion for some individuals. Um, the confusion produced by owners uprooting themselves and fleeing with the British um, allowed some slaves to escape, obviously, and some slaves simply enjoyed increased autonomy when their masters um, became consumed with their own familial survival during the conflict. Many patriots, while they were adamant patriots, nonetheless withdrew to safer parts of Maryland and left their slaves in charge of their plantations. So viewed this way, the American Revolution becomes seen less as a defining moment in the lives of African Americans. And rather, the American Revolution produced a level of uncertainty that allowed some slaves greater latitude in administering to their day-to-day -day tasks, and in some ways planning ways to ensure freedom on their own terms. However, at the conclusion of the war, slaveholding states such as Maryland emerged with their chief source of labor uncompromised. And what I want to do when I take a break of tea is talk a little bit about this this debate that a, a lot of scholars are familiar with, which is how can we define blacks who participated in the American Revolution? How do we how do we really know they participated because they weren't just caught up in this revolutionary fervor, or they were just really tired of being slaves and used this to their advantage? And people have made their career on this so this argument. So it's not a trivial trivial argument. Um, Scholars suggest that the democratic and egalitarian appeal of the Great Awakening prompted increased resistance, the desire for legal emancipation, and participation in the American Revolution by African Americans. Benjamin Quarles, David Brown Davis, Sylvia Fry, this is going to be repetitive to some of you, <laughs> argue that the American Revolution was really a landmark period in black life because between 55,000 and 100,000 African Americans either fought with the British or they left the United States when the British withdrew. Now, the democratization of Christianity and these theories of natural rights may have contributed to the development of a liberation of consciousness among enslaved blacks, but scholars are quite clear, including myself, that this was not a precondition for opposing slavery. During the colonial era, we know that um, Africans of particular ethnic groups established Mormon communities. We know that Igbos um, off the coast of Georgia engaged in collective suicide by drowning themselves. So one of the challenges of this 
has really been the challenge of this paper is to really trace some things that we can see that they're diff um, solidly based in some kind of tradition of resist resistance, either based on ethnicity or based on community development. And I've teased out a few examples, but I'm saying at the outset I have not found any really lively people, like you had this slave in Virginia who, when he was brought into court, he said, damn the queen and damn the governor too. So he really captures this revolutionary moment. I'm still working on finding those examples. And as Professor Stevenson said, this is just the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> now, acts of resistance, while not necessarily prompted by liberation rhetoric, nonetheless heightened tensions relating to the administrating of plantation affairs in the years leading up to the American Revolution. So planters had to deal with their slaves in, a, in addition to deciding whether or not they wanted to go to war. And this case is exemplified in the case of Thomas Ringhold, who was a planter in eastern Maryland, and actually the brother-in-law of John Galloway, who I spoke about earlier. In March 1773, Thomas Ringhold attempted to send two male slaves from his estate in Chester County, Maryland, to his brother-in-law, John Galloway. Galloway, did, Galloway needed hands for his property outside of Annapolis City. According to Ringhold, the, men, the two men were, quote, by no means prime, unquote. But they could do the work expected of them. In fact, Ringhold assumed that the slaves would go willingly, as one man previously came from that neighborhood, meaning he had already been enslaved in Annapolis and he had friends in the community, and he really really thought these slaves would go willingly. However, when they realized that they were to be distanced from their family and kin, they ran away from the farm, ran away from the pursuing overseer, and when the overseer did track them down, they turned to him and they, they quote, stood their defense with knives. They were resolute in not going. The overseer had to retreat, and he allowed the, escapes, the slaves to escape. Now, the legal, doc the legal doctrines of slavery ensured that owners and subsequently overseers maintained absolute power and authority over their slaves. While laws such as these existed in nearly every, sub every southern territory, slave owners and legislators did not anticipate, obviously, the attempts of individuals such as these hands to challenge power. As this example illustrates, being free and an overseer did not necessarily protect one from a recalcitrant slave. However, the slaveholder's the slaveholder's power in the end was absolute because he could de determine the fate of these two slaves. The attack on the overseer was deemed inexcusable. The slaves were punished. And <coughs> Ringgold had to decide the fate of these two slaves. So what he did is he decided that really only one of them was to blame. And it was this one he felt that was really the rabble rouser. He felt that the slaves would have gone willingly had not one of these slaves, and I don't have their names, they're just these slaves, would have gone and would have gone peacefully if he hadn't have been he had not have been seduced by the other to attack. So when the slaves were found, of uh, the man who would, had been so adverse to coming in the first place, the one that had surprised uh, Ringhold by not wanting to leave, he allowed him to stay at Tulip Hill. And we can only believe it's because he he did he was a good worker or, or that he had, you know, ties to that community. But he didn't want to prompt this particular slave into outright rebellion again. So we allowed him to stay on that farm. However, for the unsavory slave who was really thought to be the instigator, he was sold. And we don't have any more history of him. So I, I use these examples only to illustrate the fact that we already know this. In terms of resistance, the American Revolution, I really want to push myself to think about different ways we can understand how the American Revolution might have inspired blacks to really protest their condition. Um, so now we're going to start really by talking about the legacy of Lord Dunmore, who was the former Virginia, governor of Virginia, and looking at really the impact the American Revolution had on Chesapeake slaves. And I'm not computer savvy, so let me just point out what you really need to know. As you can see, I mean, obviously, the area of Maryland I study is right on the Chesapeake Bay. We have a lot of water, a lot of inlets, and you can't see it very well, but if you look at number 16, you'll see that it's a tiny little island. It's Poplar Island, and it was owned by the Carrolls of Maryland. And this map doesn't show it, but there were also um, islands down the coast, off the coast of Virginia, that become very important to this study because slaves flee to those islands, or slaves were already on those islands, and the British take them over 
or the British themselves landed on these islands and just used these islands as a place to reconvene. So you have a lot of black people spread out all over different parts of the Chesapeake Bay. Now, unlike their contemporaries in the Carolinas, or even Massachusetts, Maryland slaves did not really witness any military battles on land. However, the shores of the Chesapeake, around which most of Maryland's population was clustered, was the scene of almost constant naval warfare. In 1777, the governor and, committee, and Maryland Committee for Public Safety ordered that women, children, servants, and slaves leave Annapolis and other large towns on the waterfront immediately. Only those slaves assisting their masters in re removing personal effects were allowed to stay. So what happens is you have all these people, white people pull out and leave their slaves just there at the mercy of the advancing armies. The preponderance of slaves on the Chesapeake waterways and in the coastal towns were so great that one traveler noted only Negroes appeared in great abundance. Now, despite their sheer numbers in these nearly deserted coastal towns and their continued presence throughout Maryland's history, neither the American patriots, the British, nor the slaves themselves really anticipated how the mere presence of slavery could shape the procedures of the war. And this is really exemplified in the proclamation of Lord Dunmore in 1775. In, 19, in November 1775, John the Earl of Dunmore and former Virginia governor issued the following proclamation, quote, and I do hereby further declare all indented servants, Negroes, or others appertaining to rebels, free, that are, that are able to bear arms, they, enjoying his, they joining his majesty's troops as soon as may be for the more speedily reducing the colony to a proper sense of their duty to his majesty's crown and dignity. So in theory, any slaves, indentured servants, or loyal loyalists going to Dunmore's off, um, army and able to bear arms were allowed to, and in theory, the slaves were supposed to be promised their freedom. Cast as a known, well-known enemy to liberty, Dunmore's proclamation had a three-pronged effect. First, it transformed the course of African American and African participation in the war by the suggestion to, to arm slaves. Obviously, this was revolutionary. Prior to November 1775, the Continental Congress and the leading officers of the army, the American army, had decided to exclude even free blacks from future enlistment and to rely as soon as possible on an all-white army. After Dunmore's proclamation, the Continental Congress allowed free blacks to participate in the war. And for the British, they didn't move from actually suggesting that they would allow blacks to bear arms to, arms to actively, enlist, actively enlisting them until 1779. And in Maryland, actually, there were rumors that they would raise what they were calling a Negro regiment, but laws were never passed. It's talked about in some, some of the planted papers, but they never moved to formally approving a law. The second thing that the proclamation did was that it provided incentives for slaves wishing to flee and reinforced the fear of slaveholders that their slaves would run away. And third, for the slaves themselves, the proclamation offered a vehicle for freedom, even in the abstract form. Speaking specifically about South Carolina, one historian notes, quote, for the vast majority of slaves who participated in the revolution, the arrival of the British army was a liberating moment. You'll have to excuse me, I always come down with a cold and write something in California. <sighs> if waiting for the advancing British lines encouraged some slaves, Dunmore's approach of the Chesapeake sparked enough fear in whites that Maryland officials were resolved to maintain power over their land and human property. Corresponding with military headquarters in Northampton, Virginia, one officer noted, quote, if Lord Dunmore expects to meet with more favor in Maryland than he has experienced in Virginia, he will, we trust, be greatly disappointed, unquote. However, the British were far from disappointed, at least in terms of confiscating physical property. Like I said, this abundance of, of blacks and so few whites in the Chesapeake Islands, and I showed you the islands a minute, a minute ago, really left the slaves at the mercy of the British. Tobacco, produce, livestock, and slaves were the targets of both the British and the Tory activity. And one of Dunmore's Moore's captains was determined to either capture principal people, meaning principal American leaders, or at least, quote, some of their Negroes, unquote. Indeed, the British were quite successful in their e efforts to steal at least a few slaves or destroy property. In September 1777, the British invaded Poplar Island, which was owned by the Carroll family. The soldiers, quote, destroyed the salt-making operation and carried off a few slaves on the plantation boat, unquote. 
Now, what's interesting about this particular narrative is that while the British absconded with several of these slaves, the majority of slaves on this island remained during the course of the entire war. They remained and they operated the plantation for the Carols. And there's no real reason given for why they did that. So my speculation is, obviously, they're already settled. They have their family and their community there. The Carol slaves, um, there was about four, and I, I can prove this, there was four generations of families on the Carol plantation. So perhaps this, the slaves didn't run away from this island because that, that's where their people were. For whatever reasons that they did stay, in 1781, Charles Carroll Carrollton rewarded the island workers by moving them to his home in Anne Arundel County. And he did realize that some people would need to supervise the island, so he allowed one slave woman named Suki and her husband to stay and oversee the island. Now, aside from this island invasion, few of the Carroll slaves on this island, their other properties, even experienced con contact with the British or the American military. And that these particular slaves didn't flee isn't too exceptional because this was really the first pass of the Chesapeake for the British. However, on the second pass of the Chesapeake, slaves became a little bit more, not even became a little bit more aware, were more willing to escape to Denmark. And in fact, the Council of Slavery, the Council of Safety cautioned Thomas Price to look for runaway blacks who entered his neighborhood chiefly in order to, as he called it, seduce other slaves to leave their owners. So they would get off these British ships, they would go to these neighboring uh, places, and they would try to seduce these slaves to come join them. In Virginia, um, blacks really actually took it upon themselves to steal a schooner and attempted to escape to Lord Dunmar. And they were, they were unsuccessful, unfortunately, as a whaling boat overtook them the next day. But officers noted that this was the most remarkable, they'd, remarkable event they had witnessed in the war to date. So there wasn't too much going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> While fewer slaves ran away than those in South Carolina or even neighboring Virginia, the ones who did, did so used the increased presence of so many ships in the docking harbors to cloak their escape. Dick and Jack, two, mul two mulatto lads, ran away in 1780. The owners, Charles Alexander Warfield and James Howard, suggested, quote, they will make either to Baltimore town or Annapolis, and that their intention is to enlist as soldiers or endeavor to get aboard a vessel that is bound from one of the above places, unquote. And runaway such as this continued to be a problem even at the end of the war. Colonel John Weems, uh, quote, posted guards at the most convenient places to prevent Negroes from going to the enemy and even secured all boats and canoes, unquote. Now I should say that not every escaped slave, not every black attracted to the loyalist was an escaped slave. Many were taken from uh, sequestered estates, others were captured in raids, raids, still others were free persons of color who chose to go with the British. Of the blacks who still remained with Lord Dunmar in 1783, 83 admitted to having been brought involuntarily, approximately 1,100 were acknowledged runaways, and 409 claimed to be legally free already. And of this number, a mere 49 declared that they had been recruited directly as soldiers. Now despite the attempts of slaves and free blacks to reach the British lines, they were not always met with the welcome they anticipated. For example, it was fine to steal the slaves of the Americans, but integrating those individuals into the British plan for action was something else entirely. And if the slave was used in the ar army, their status did not change. If a slave or even a free black escaped the fate of remaining a slave of the British army, they faced the possibility of being handed over to compensation, as compensation to a loyalist who maybe lost their slaves or real estate when the American arms compensated them. The other thing that Lord Dunmore did is that he refused sanctuary to run away blacks unless he could use them for his army, and we see that that didn't even happen until later in the period. But because so many of his supporters refused to abandon their slaves, you still do see a, a presence of black people in the Loyalist ranks. Of the coast of St. George Islands, which is um, next to, at the head of St. Mary's River in Maryland, it was reported that the British fleet consisted of, quote, 50 regulars of the 14th Regiment, about 150 Tories, and about 100 Negroes that bear arms, unquote. And then on the smaller crash, there, it was noted by some observers that there were tradesmen and blacks, people in several of the boats. Now, in addition to 
we're seeing a dubious status among Dunmore's ranks. What I think is very important in this discussion is that death and disease was really rampant, disease was really rampant and it affected those who did escape because this is a war. So, you know, food provisions are low, hygiene is low. <coughs> Smallpox was discovered on one of Dunmore's ships in the Potomac and a local committee of safety reported, well, we have two small vessels drove on shore from the fleet. One bo on board one of them was three whites and two Negroes, three of which now have smallpox on them, unquote. On Gwen's Island, the inhabitants were sick with smallpox and the blacks had gala fever. And an officer noted that on Gwen's Island, quote, the shores are so full of dead bodies, chiefly Negroes. I think that if, if they stay here any time, they must be ruined. For by death, desertion, and the worm, I think their business must be completely done. The officers who have been here some time imagine that about 50 corpses, corpses have been thrown on the shores, unquote. So you can see that the spread of smallpox and other diseases was quite serious during the war. As far as north as Ches Chestertown, Maryland, the Galloway struggled, struggled over the decision about whether or not to inoc inoculate their slaves. So, but for others, the reality of disease and malnourishment also meant that they might be left without their family members. One historian noted that on Gwen's Island, a black child sought nourishment from the breast of its dead mother. In this instant, the child's mother possibly fled to the British in order to save the life of her child. Unfortunately, the disease associated with the war errantly removed this mother from her child's life. As these examples indicate, seeking liberty from the British promised a very uncertain future for slaves and free blacks alike. While they were permitted to remain with Dunmore's fleet, they were also endured the reality of war disease, dehydration, and removal from their familiar settings, to name but a few. The British and American government used the existence of slaves to their military advantage. And in the post-war period, the economic incentives provided by slave labor, rather than the physical presence of slaves, influenced treaty negotiation. In many ways, what the American Revolution does, instead of being this defining moment, it solidifies the continuation of the Southern slaveocracy. The Patriots were consciously, I'm sorry, the Patriots consciously and deliberately safeguarded the institution of bondage. And in this way, Americans were very similar to the British contemporaries who they just fought a war with. As scholar Chris Brown argues, that in addition to serving as a scheme of labor, slavery also established status in British, status in British America. So a system of racial slavery is a productive economic endeavor and a source of inexhaustible labor did not change with the end of colonial rule. So for blacks, the war for American independence merely intensified physical hardship before it some freedom, but slave life, and particularly slave family lives, remained delicate. On November 30th, 1782, the Provisional Peace Agreement was signed in Paris between Britain and the United States. The British agreed to withdraw from the United States, set prisoners at liberty, and to do so without causing any destruction, carrying away any Negroes or other property of the American inhabitants. Though a smooth conclusion of the war was the goal, the lives of blacks and whites were in considerable disarray. In addition to rebuilding their lives, patriots and loyalists petitioned their governments for property that they lost during the war. And this is something that I find very interesting because you have people on both sides of the Atlantic petitioning their government for things they lost, such as furniture, real estate, and of course, slaves. And for those loyalists who left that had business dealings with people in Maryland, there's a fight also in the courts about, obviously, slaves that might have um, belonged to, for example, the, the Baltimore Company, which was an iron company. So I have records in both Maryland and Britain, really people fighting over the same slaves. Of course, we, we, don't, we don't know what the slaves had to say about it, but we do know what the owners had to say, to say about it. So in some instances, opportuni opportunistic businessmen capitalized on their na neighbor's misfortune by purchasing their confiscated property, or they simply kept the slaves who wandered into their position, possession during the war. For African Americans, the war's ideological scope served as hope for a country with a new, re renewed racial outlook. However, for the slaves who did make it to the British lines, they also face the reality that they may be returned to their owners. Free and enslaved blacks also face the reality that they obviously may be given as a gift to decorated military officers, 
And if they did relocate to some place outside of the United States, there was no guarantee that they would not face prejudice based on their race. So the future for slaves who stayed on abandoned plantations after the war was equally unsure. They were put on auction and sold with various plantation goods. And in the interest of time, I'm going to really skip over the section where we talk about these British and Maryland claimants looking for their, their lost slaves. And I'm going to really move on to where my advisor thinks the real need is. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say this as a way to segue. Just as the Dunmore Proclamation transformed the question of the question of slaves in the war, the presence of slaves, and in particular, slaves abandoned or lost during the war, influenced how both governments rewarded the loyalty of their followers. The British government rewarded loyalists by approving their claims for lost property, and they would give them monetary reimbursement. Obviously, they didn't give them the slaves because the slaves were still in the US. And the state of Maryland rewarded particularly influential patriots by honoring their claims to British property, which included land, household supplies, farm equipment, corporate holdings, and slaves. Now, slaves did resist the reinstitution of slaveholding power by employing many of the mechanisms they used prior to the war for American independence. They were slower, abstained from pregnancy, defied owners ultimately, or even stole from whites if it would improve their condition. And probably the biggest challenge facing all slaves, whether they left with the British or they stayed on properties transferred to new owners, was that they continued to be vulnerable in numerous, way, in numerous ways. Um, this is where I, I, I really want to shift, and I want to talk about how black women's experience during this, during the war was uniquely different from their black male counterparts or from whites of any status. And I start with this image. This is really a common image, and I'm actually not going to do a read on it. This is a common image of black women during the colonial era. I call this a gaggle of black women running around with their shirts off. Historian Jennifer Morgan did a really wonderful argue, um, article that I always refer to. And she talks about Edward Long going up the coast of Africa. And he looked at these black women and said, oh, their breasts are so immense. I mean, they're long. Some could suckle over their shoulders. And I think this is a really, this is a very important argument that Jennifer Morgan makes because everyone reads Edward Long's papers. And she's one of the first people to really say, let's really look at, let me back up. She's the first to read Edward Long's papers looking specifically for black women. And that's what inspired me to say, well, if they're making these assumptions of black women off the coast of Africa, they must be making them in colonial America. And really, that seems very basic to us, but few people really started to talk about this. So, power, gender, and race undeniably <coughs> set black women apart from their enslaved male counterparts, just as these three variables separated black women from elite and even landless whites. The examples of African American defiance during the revolution are overwhelmingly male centered. With the exception of a few truly heroic narratives, the majority of slave women did not run away during the war. In fact, few slave women even found a haven behind British lines. The women who did flee slipped into the anonymity of urban life by passing as free blacks. The, the narratives that do emerge about black women doing, during the American Revolution speak to their paradox, that a stable family life was the source of both their physical strength and their vulnerability. In addition, these narratives also offer the repeated theme that black women, more so than black men and poor white women, were denied even the most basic opportunities for power, power over their bodies, and in some cases, power regarding the lives of their offspring. The American Revolution actually increased the rate of sexual vulnerability for black women. Benjamin Eaglestone resided six miles from Baltimore town, which is present-day Baltimore City. He was aware that his missing slave woman, quote, may endeavor to pass as a free woman, unquote. However, the advertisement clearly suggests that Eagleston understood that his slave woman was victim to special circumstance because of her gender. He was very concerned that, quote, some rogue, perhaps a soldier, has carried off with her, unquote. The, re the reward was posted as $8 and recent the charges. The ad conveys many of the sentiments found in other, way no other runaway notices. So I'm using this as one example to summarize what I've seen in several of the newspapers I've looked at. It was assumed that men ran away to join the, the army, either British or American, whereas missing women may have been abducted. The possible assailant in this piece was labeled as a rogue. That Eagleston is willing to worry about the fate of his slave woman at the hand of some rogue does give a moment of pause. 
Was this characterization of the black woman as vulnerable and the man as a rogue truly an effort to vindicate this vindicate the slave as a woman, complete with all the trappings of womanhood, such as virtue? Or was the characterization merely a result of anti-British sentiment? And I ask this because um, the findings of Kathleen Brown and other scholars suggest that white women were only defined such in comparison to non-Christians, black, and Native American women, and vice versa, black women were only defined such by what they were not. In this way, Brown suggests that race and secondarily, gender becomes a mechanism to control some women and to limit their access to the power structure. So perhaps this black woman was only defined such, not a, as a comparison with a white woman, but because she was juxtaposed to a sailor whom I can infer from the ad was British. So perhaps she was only, only categorized as a woman because there was such a high sentiment against the British. Now even without the speculative example of sexual exploitation, black women did experience the war differently from white men or even their black male counterparts. Black women, particularly slave women, we know this, have the least formal power and perhaps were the most vulnerable group in America. And if they were enslaved, they represented the ultimate form of revenue, the reproducers of more property. And as reproducers of the slave population, black women were often subjected to sexual exploitation and abuse by all men regardless of race. As a result, it is quite reasonable to assume that black men in both armies may have privileged themselves to everything on abandoned or seized plantations, including sexual relations with black women or even girls who were left without protection. And if there were a lot, was a large presence of other slaves, there was no guarantee that they would be any more successful in defending against the advances of an armed military brigade. In addition to the continued sexual persecution, black women also experienced revolutionary ideas in fundamentally different ways from the white men who tried to claim the war for themselves and for the white women who remained so awkwardly suspended between their racial, racial pejoratives on the one hand and gender and class liabilities on the other. We are one here. This point was made clear by looking at the case of Anne Tilly and her slave woman. Anne Tilly, a destitute, destitute white woman and former tavern owner in Annapolis City, repeatedly found herself on hard times. She shows up in newspapers, court records, and minutes of special legislative sessions, and she's also always asking for some kind of financial reimbursement. She was indicted in 1779 for selling liquor, but mounted her defense for this and subsequent cases she made during the war because she was, quote, robbed of her slaves, the greatest part of her substance and that she was reduced to strange circumstances. In March, I'm sorry, in March 21st, on March 21st, 1781, Anne Tilly petitioned the Maryland Council of Slavery for help in reclaiming her, quote, lost slave, unquote. Tilly was allowed to board abandoned ships lying in the road of this city, meaning Annapolis, to endeavor to claim of the commanding officers a Negro woman and three children, her property, her, her property, meaning Tilly's property, taken away by a mulatto man, the husband of the said woman. Now, Tilly did enjoy compensation from the council of safety. She was allowed to go back and reclaim her slave. And she was probably allowed this because she had repeated requests of poverty because of the war. But by approving Tilly's petition to reclaim her lost slave, the Maryland Council of Safety failed to recognize that perhaps the unnamed slave woman and her mulatto husband embraced the ideals of the revolution as their perceived right to be together as a family. So the questions of authority and family ties is really not limited to white women, such as Antillian, and to this particular slave women. I actually had a better example. Um, and it's really a, an example illustrating how this was really structured into the government and into the psyche of our leaders. In January 1781, John Hanson, the first president of the United States under the Articles of Confederation, began the year by administrating to the affairs of the young nation. He was equally, equally concerned with his role as one of Maryland's prominent slaveholders. Corresponding to his son in Fredericktown, Maryland, he reviewed that though he was leader of the United States, he still dealt with the ordeals of being a slaveholder. He was particularly irritated with Ned Barnes, this perpetual runaway slave. As late as July 1781, Hansen offered 30 hard dollars for reward for the return of Barnes. During this month, the slave stole a horse and it was suspected that he, he ran away in order to enlist with the loyalists. Later that month, he was apprehended, but unfortunately for this particular slave man, 
His repeated attempts at flight cost him exactly what he may have been running towards, which was his wife. Originally, Hansen consented to buy Barnes's wife. However, after the man's second escape and exasperated Hansen, instructed his son to sell Barnes in Baltimore City. As exhibited in the case of Ned Barnes and his unnamed wife, the institution of slavery in post-revolutionary Maryland continued to impede slavery marriages and family networks. Hansen's treatment of the Barnes marital bonds differs from his own directives for his son to love his family and discipline the slaves as necessary. Before he closed the letter, Hansen gave explicit instructions for his son to care for his mother, but he could do what he pleased with a certain female slave. This casual instruction may not have been received so lightly. How would the young man interpret do as you please with a slave? Was she to remain in close contact with him? If so, how would she adjust to, or, or if she was sold, how would she adjust to her new surroundings? Did she have family members that she may be separated from? The fate of this unnamed slave is unknown. Yet it is safe to assume that the perception of her gender and based on her racial, based on pre-existing racial assumptions about black women's sexuality did open her to countless opportunities for victimization if she did indeed um, meet with a new owner. As the above examples illustrate, Maryland closed his chapter on the American Revolution with really the same tensions about slave trading and slaveholding that existed when the war began. In 1782, Dan St. Daniel St. Thomas of Jennifer conducted a census for the state of Mar Maryland. He found that approximately 200,000 whites resided in the state, and blacks numbered approximately 83,000. So freedom's paradox ev evidenced itself in this particular state in a number of ways. The development of an independent nation based on con a constitutional government continued to oppress free blacks, legislate the exploitation of black women, and destroy the family life of all blacks in all stations, regardless of status. However, whites reclaimed their property and celebrated their victory with cheers of triumph and reports of a jubilee. The question of slavery and the limits of natural rights for blacks reemerged with the passing of the aliens, alien laws in 1798, heightened in the wake of Santo Domingo, Gabriel's Rebellion, and then the plot of Denmark Vesey. Now, though blacks appeared in great abundance during the revolutionary years, only a few actually gained freedom by legal methods. However, what happens in Maryland in the dec decades following the revolution is that there's a decreasing dependence on slave labor, as I've already said. So thus, sla though slaves did not immediately gain freedom during or after the American Revolution, freedom through manumission did become a greater possibility for some slaves whose owners were influenced either by revolutionary ideology that aimed for, quote, all men to be free, unquote, Christian anti-slavery rhetoric holding that it was a crime against God to hold, quote, human kind of bondage, unquote, or simply as a result of the changing e economy in this particular state that went from a tobacco uh, producing economy in, a, in economy in need of a large labor force to a more grain-based economy that only man mandated employment several times a year. For whatever reason, in 1821, John Gatherley, the young man who at the beginning of this paper was more concerned with carrying sugar negroes from the, was more considered concerned, excuse me, with carrying molasses and sugar negroes, let me back up, sorry. For whatever reason, in 1821, John Galloway, who at the beginning of this paper, was more concerned with the American Revolution than he was with carrying a few sugar negroes, signed a manumission deed which got, gradually freed his slave woman, Maria Boston and her five children. Perhaps this one slave family witnessed one of the other true paradoxes of freedom. They were free, though gradually, over the course of 20 years, but they did escape part of their lives in bondage. However, Maryland laws dictated that freed slaves be able to provide sufficient livelihood or face re-enslavement. And it would take this one formerly enslaved family and others like them who enjoyed the rising manumission aids in Maryland generations to entangle how exactly the legacies of the American Revolution impacted their lives. To what extent these individuals and other li others like them accepted or rejected the meaning of freedom, the American Revolution, and liberty in post-revolutionary America is certainly debatable. Start late, and I understand people probably have to leave because this is a ground bag. So I won't be offended.
<laughs> if you have to excuse yourself, but I, I will take a few minutes for questions. Is that Alex, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, growing up in Virginia, studying the slave trade there and, and what went on, there wasn't as much um, emphasis placed on slaves being free to join the war effort because of uh, the tobacco being king in Virginia and the Carolinas. What, I don't know what the chief agricultural crop of Maryland is or if that played a role in, in, in your research when you, when you were looking at uh, slaves being free to join the war effort. Well, slaves weren't really free to join the war effort. They would just run away. The, the predominant agricultural um, tobacco was the leading crop until after the revolution. Yeah, like for whatever our reason, cereal production, grain production takes over. So many of these planters may have um, just not have needed, needed a long-term employable labor force. Tobacco you need to cultivate over the course of a year, and you need a considerable number of hands, whereas grain production you only need during several parts of the year. So it became easier to free some slaves and keep other slaves that you hire out. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, consider, but of course crop production plays into this. It's just one of the many variables that account for slaves being freed after the revolution. Yes. Did you say whether where slaves and the freed slaves ended up, I think you said 55,000, but did you say whether they ended up in the United States or Canada or England or West Indies? All of the above. I did not say that, but they ended up in all of the above. And when they ended up in those places in Canada, in Canada, um, you know, they were able to cultivate a community and they're still there. And in, in British, um, in England, so that's actually a course of a future project once I get the dissertation done. So they did relocate, and I tried to make that point, but that doesn't mean their life was all, come on in, Martin. <laughs> that didn't mean their life was, you know. But mostly where, West Indies or? No, Canada, Canada. And really what happened is, though you have about, these numbers are debatable, I haven't done the hard statistics of this, I've relied on the work of other people, but where they end up, or how successful they were in actually leaving the country is debatable because I looked at the documents. Um, before the British could absolutely pull out, they had to do a ledger of all the slaves they had with them and give those slave owners the opportunity to come back and reclaim their slaves. So what I'd really like to do is go back and figure out, not for the dissertation, go back and figure out <laughs> <laughs> which of those who left, who were actually slaves and who were actually free. And there's been work, like I said, um, done on the British loyalists in Canada. Yes. And did you say whether at the time Brit had Britain already dropped slavery in their in their own land? That doesn't happen until what 1830. Okay. Not yet. The well, still right. right. In, in Britain, I don't think uh, slavery was allowed. No, but the slave trade. Right. The I slave mean, British trade. British and their dependents right. are carrying the, right. the slaves. So yes, thank you. Mike. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you see a um, any sort of connection between. Uh, Who's winning the war in some of these positions? Because at one point, you know, you talked about people who stayed on the plantation, um, and you know, it might be useful to look at this, um, much like the Indians, uh, you know, who are trying to play one side off of the other, and they realize, you know, if, for instance, if uh, the Patriots win, and they turned out to have, uh, you know, uh, um, run away or something, life is going to be a lot worse. For them, so um, you know there is this motivation based upon you know, who's you know more likely to stand up for their freedom, but there's also that motivation of who's more likely to win. Absolutely, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that you know there was a point in the war that we did look like the British were going to win, and mm -hmm. the French just appeared out of nowhere and helped the Americans. So I I agree with that. One of the problems with doing this particular topic uh, in Maryland, in the state, a localized topic, is that the publication of the, the predominant newspaper stopped. So I wasn't able to trace who the slaves were, who were they running away from. The only way I've been able to reconstruct it is to look at these government documents over who was trying to find their slaves after the war. So it's not as, it's not as logical and linear as I'd like it to be. Um, my question is pertaining to uh, slaves may service uh, military service. Mm -hmm. 
you have to climb the line with the brick. Mm -hmm. uh, did you find any evidence um, of the slaves that served with the British uh, under the Cornwallis Directive? It turns out the Cornwallis uh, Directive for all this uh, commanders in the field, mm -hmm. particularly in the southern colonies, to let African slaves know that if they fought, if they left their masters and decided to come and fight for the British crown, that they would be uh, free from slavery being. And after the war, if the British won the revolution, that they would be allowed to serve in a new British colonial type government. Did you find any evidence of that on the side of the African Americans that fought for the crown? I did not, and the reason I did not is because this whole preoccupation with the British was really an unintended consequence of the dissertation. And I focused really on what happened after Dunmore's proclamation. But I think you're right, I do need to look at what happened to the people who joined after Cornwallis makes this um, proclamation. So yes, that is something that, as I rewrite, I will try to incorporate. Let me see if I can get one other person that will come back here. Jeremy? Yeah, I was surprised. You said you said uh, that the Africans had no remembrance of Africa. Now that's, I'd like to challenge you on that. You can challenge me on that. As an Africanist, I appreciate that. What I was really trying to say is that, um, and we know from Michael Gomez's study and others, that obviously there's this high influence of African. People are experiencing Africa, as Michael Gomez says so well that I'm just going to quote, through the intonations of their parents. So there is these there are these traditions that are um, being passed down. When I said that they are an absolute distinct American culture, no, I don't accept that. I did, for the interest of this paper, try to shorten um, all kind of references to, you know, Africans. I tried to shorten all kinds of references to the slave trade and to the importations of Africans only because it was detracting from the, the actual flow of the paper. So no, I don't accept that they had a, a, absolutely no remembrance. It was more of a, I was using more of a literary tool. Yes? Well, first, I'm, I'm sorry, the question just popped in my head was whether the slave trade actually continued during the war. And the second question is, following his question, assuming the war was worst from the American point of view in what, 76 or 77, was the rate of slaves escaping highest in those years? When the, and the situation looked worse for America. I mean, what, the winter at Valley Fort what was the famous time when the Americans were at their bottom. Well, again, this was a local study. And what I've tried to do is try to make some larger implications. And I can't answer that question based on the Maryland runaway slave ads. In general, yes. But to make it spe specifically local, I, I can't answer that question because the publications of the newspaper mm -hmm. stopped. So I might have one record of one slave running away. Um, and that's how most historians you know, draft this information. They look at and they draft one of runaway slave advertisements. And did slave trade actually go on during the, maybe you said this also in the early part of the talk, did the slave trade going for the Americans go on during the Revolutionary War? Yes, but there was considerable blockade, so there was smuggling. So, yes, not in as great numbers, there's smuggling. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.